Good morning. It's it's Friday. Phew, what a week. I was just talking earlier to CJ, who's joining me today. Going, oh my God, what a week it's been. Um, but thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, our, I guess today we're going to talk about Twitter, which is what we said, but I'd really, really like to make this a discussion. So um, for those of you, uh, as you join, can you just not just ask questions, but I'd love to know what people's opinions are. What should brands do about Twitter? Should they dump it? Should they stay on there? Should they exploit it? What What is the thing we need to be doing? Um, and CJ has been um, advising a lot of our clients, spending time on picking the chaos of the last few weeks. Um, so I'm going to ask him a few questions, but please, please tell us what you think, because we're really keen to find out what people uh, think of the alternatives, what they should be doing as a brand, and what the impact might be on not just our customer base, but our employees. So I'll kick off with a, a, a broad question, I think, CJ, <laughs> which is Twitter is actually quite a small network, um, particularly when you compare it to the meta channels and certainly now, certainly a lot more with TikTok, for instance. But it punches above its weight. Why? That's a really good question. Um... I think there's an immediacy to it. There's a journalistic nature to it. Um, I mean, you, you know, I spent a bit of my career over at Lewis PR, and I remember 2009, somewhere around 2008, 2009, I joined Twitter and I had a conversation with Chris Lewis, who himself used to be a journalist over at the FT. And he was adamant at that point that Twitter had changed the news cycle to just 30 seconds. And that if journalists weren't on the button with their stories, they they were going to to miss the beat and we saw that i mean if you think of all the incidents that break hashtags trending the moment an occurrence happens twitter is kind of the place where the story emerges i, mean, I know journalists were unhappy with the emergence of that because it meant they could no longer do long lunches and like the, uh, to, and then go back to the, the the office and file the stories but the immediacy to it the journalistic nature to it has been infectious to to some I mean, I, the whole Twitter thing's really affected me a bit, and I've been trying to figure out why. And then um, I saw that brilliant um, comment on um, LinkedIn, and I, forgive me, I'm going to forget her Christian name, um, Miss Guzman, who was speaking at our event uh, a couple of weeks ago, okay. a um, good friend of yours. I, it, she said it was her first love. And I took a step back and I thought, Do you know, that's why this has affected me so much, because I was on Facebook. But I spent so much time being drawn into stories and drawn into moments and drawn into happenings on Twitter. And I think it's that immediacy that has been quite infectious for the platform. And of course, the founder, Jack Dorsey, he was all about user experience. So when Zuck was playing around with monetization, which we'll undoubtedly talk a bit about later, Jack was, well, how can I give the users what they, they want? And he, he had a bullishness to almost uh, refrain from going over to the monetization side. And I think that probably helped in the formative years. Yeah, I, yes, I'm, I'm with you. I am um, just a quick one. Hi, Anita. Hi, Anna. Hi, Tasha. <laughs> Hi, Philip. <laughs> Hi, Neville. Nice to see you, Neville. Um, and also, there's a really nice point from Susanna, which we'll get on to, actually, which is shocking treatment of employees. So that kind yeah. of brings me on to this, this bit, which is Musk took over October the 27th, although it feels like he's been there forever. Yeah. And mid mass layoffs, you know, the, the losing of key leaders. Yeah. What, why does this, you know, we're talking about the brands. Why does this matter to brands? I think ultimately um, brands are going to have to have a decision about how much of the behaviour of Twitter they can accommodate, accommodate and be comfortable with. And there's a lot. I mean, as you, you rightly said, I've spent the better part of the last two weeks going back to my journalistic and PR roots, chasing down every story, looking at every um, bit of conjecture that's gone in social. I've been speaking to senior people in confidence within Twitter. Um it has been a shocking happening. And the first thing brands need to do is 
operate on facts, right? And they need to make sure that they're surfacing what has happened. You reference the mass layoffs. I mean, it, it's, it's big news now. He, Musk is reported to have expected to have lost two and a half thousand. And we'll come on to why we probably knew it'd have to do that in, in, in a bit. But my information is that last week, I believe the number to be closer to 5,000. I spoke to um, a very trusted, confident only an hour ago, and I'm led to believe the number's nearer 5,600. Now, that wasn't planned. Two and a half thousand to go. Um, there was expected to be a ripple effect. But unbelievably, what Musk didn't account for was people standing up for their colleagues and the manner in which people were being dispelled. Facebook have made redundancies. Amazon have made redundancies. The accumulative numbers are far greater than Twitter, but they're not headline news because they've conducted it in the right way. And it is the conduct of the Twitter leadership, the ownership, which has been very distasteful for, for people. I know pregnant women have had employment terminated, people under protected rights. I know of um, a, a person who now identifies as a female. I'm part of the transgender community, employment terminated in the most degrading of fashions. And it's these stories which are rippling across media. And brands rightly are saying, do we want to be associated with this? Because we're a people first business. And we put our people first. And we would never dispel of employment law and the compliance of international law just for a profit margin. And on the face of it, that's what Musk has been doing. Now, Musk would say it had to happen. He parted with $44 billion to transfer ownership. He claimed in a matter of days that uh, from ownership that Twitter was losing $4 million a day. Now, I struggle to believe that number, but let's, as I put in a blog earlier this week, let's just take that on face value for a moment. That amounts to a $1.46 billion loss per annum. So it does question, why would you part with 44 billion quid for an entity that's losing that sort of number? As you know, Casey, some years ago, um, before COVID, BBC News, I was doing the quarterly earning calls. It was a Twitter earning call. Once again, they hadn't hit profitability. And Aaron Heselhurst, the presenter, asked me, is the little bird ever going to be profitable? And I distinctly remember his question because of how he phrased it. And my response was, do you know what? Twitter haven't brought enough products to market. And in social media, it's your ad platform product offering that's your main revenue stream. Something that Facebook were brilliant at doing, far superior ad platform at the time. I went on to say, we know they had high staff costs and we know Jack Dorsey hadn't moved from his commitment to customer journey and he probably needed to do that. But I went on the record saying, I don't see a profitable quarter for Twitter on the horizon. So I'd be a hypocrite if I said, cuts were not needed and expected to balance the books. Putting my MD hat on, numbers have got to be balanced up. But it's how he did it that has been really painful for people watching. And calling this question, do we want to be associated with a platform that's underhand? Now, the other side of the argument is industry, audience, we can all be a fickle bunch, they say. P&O Cruises, they were pretty awful with their conduct of staff four or five months ago. I'm led to believe they had a really profitable summer with people getting back on the ferries. So I think businesses are going to have to look at all the information available and ask themselves, how comfortable are we? And where do we draw the line with conduct and, uh, and behavior? Um, because I don't think Twitter's going to fall over now. I think it's here to say some of the data coming out this week suggests that they're coping. So now it's about how comfortable are we about how he's jettisoned so many people. We know there are um, we know there are legal cases in California. I've had it confirmed that um, the WARN Act, uh, which in California means you have to give 60 days notice if there's going to be mass redundancies, uh, he dispelled with that. I have been told by a senior VP in Europe that they know there is a legal case coming in the UK because more than 20 people were dismissed and weren't put on a period of consultation. The same individual has told me they expect um, additional European um, tribunals or lawsuits from at least Ireland, if not Germany as well. Now, that individual then left a couple of days later for the moral reasons we're talking about. But there's a lot of turmoil 
within Twitter HQ right now? I think it's it. I think the bit which I think is is really interesting is is that bit about does it align to you? you businesses need to think about this, and I think there's you know we we've talked a lot in the last two or three years about businesses with purpose aligning to your values about company culture to keep talent and I think there's a large amount of this which you have to kind of go this is if this is what Twitter is doing and the wash up is that it's a badly behaved business how 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 much of a correlation does that have not just in terms of our customer base but also as I said earlier employees no I I, I, I took a look at um, Matt's other companies because my initial thought two weeks ago was, well, I don't associate these bad behaviours with PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. But then last week, it became apparent that the same incident has happened at Tesla and there's an outstanding employment and legal case within Tesla where he's just dispelled own people. Now, I find it interesting that that's not spoken about when we see the, the astonishing share price within Tesla and the, the, the car purchases. But there is a ever so slight pattern of behavior with the entrepreneur, as we know. And I've got to be careful what I say, Katie, because I know you are an entrepreneur and I don't want to insult you to your face. But there are characteristics of entrepreneurs that can smudge the lines and push the boundaries and think differently to other people. And we know Musk has that in abundance because he has made a career out of building wonderful organizations. We can't knock him for his commercial achievements. But I think he's gone too far with Twitter. And I think he's overstepping because change is needed. And brands now to be look, need, need to be considering, well, what does that mean for us and our values, as you say? I think it's interesting, um, Neville's with us. And he says, the question arises for brands, do we really want to use a platform that treats every everyone employees and users so appallingly and i think that probably is the big cornerstone question against yeah. your business values your culture and the way you wish to be perceived so there's those elements which only businesses can decide upon um but i think there's also there's also another element to this which is that twitter really derives its power from the value of 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 basically I think there's three groups politicians because we go there to see what they have to say uh celebrities um some of which as you know are leaving and journalists so we go there as you rightly said it's in the moment stuff isn't it which brings us to the fact that that Musk is throwing open the doors now to those people that have been banned from yeah. trolls and alt-right through to Trump although Trump says he's not coming back how how does that impact brands? Because it's not just now users, it's people who have potentially have influence and reach. Yeah, and there's immediate risk here which brands need to, to be uh, aware of because uh, Twitter did lose the entire team that is responsible for um, copyright governance, um, content monitoring and verification. Um, and that wasn't expected, by the way. Some of the coders within those teams were regarded as um, elitists within Twitter, and the blueprint was for them to stay, and they were part of the people that made the moral stance saying, I'm not working at an organisation that treats people like this, and they went for the exit doors. Um, what, what that has meant is uh, <laughs> people can impersonate brands at the moment, although in the last three days they've had coders working on it to, to fix this problem. Some of the viewers um, today might be aware of what happened with Eli Lilly um, two weeks ago. And to explain, um, the verification um, process changed. An erratic user um, paid for the, the $7 um, uh, uh, verification to get the blue tick. They changed their username to mirror Eli Lilly. And they went and put an artwork up on their banner and their profile image of Eli Lilly. And then posted, insulin is now free tens of millions was wiped off of Eli Lilly's value overnight. Now, they've rallied, they've re made the, the recovery, but it threw up a big question mark about, well, okay, how do we protect brands? Musk has come out in the last four or five days with a series of posts saying that uh, the team have been working on it. Um, they've clamped down on the ability for impersonation. The new verification model was supposed to launch yesterday. And then um, late last night, there was a, a delay. It's now coming next week. 
and I now know the, the, the structure it's going to have. I'm going to refer to some notes above the, the laptop so I get this right for you because it's, I've only just become aware of this in the last hour. There will now be a gold check for companies, a grey check for government officials and a blue for individuals, celebrity or not. And all verified accounts will be re-verified before the change happens, expected middle of next week. But the bit in that that I found really interesting that plays to your initial question, uh, you can pay for the blue tick. Celebrities are going to be identified by, by a blue tick. People of interest, journalists are going to be identified as a, as a blue tick. So I'm not sure how people are going to stand out prominently. And of course, this is against the backdrop of people being able to spend $7 a month to have the blue tick. Now, at our event, you will recall um, asking the question to the audience, how many of you will pay for a blue tick? There weren't many hands that went up. And if you look at what's happening with Netflix's numbers and their subscription model at the moment, <laughs> that would suggest he's got a challenge if Musk believes people are going to go in on. on, on that, there was that survey, wasn't there, where 70 percent of um, millennials were surveyed as to whether or not they would they would pay for a blue tick. And, yeah. or, no, it wasn't. Or millennials were surveyed and 70% said no way. <laughs> yeah. and, and, I mean, are we surprised by that? Absolutely not. I, I think the the verification that historically within Twitter had a bit of kudos within it and you wanted the blue tick, so you were considered part of being a person of interest. I hold my hands up for many years. I tried to get verified. I failed miserably at getting <laughs> verified. Um, but it was a way of identifying the journalist. Should I pay attention to the inference that's coming out? And I don't want to get into the media debate of whether you should pay attention to certain titles in journalists. But it was a means of calling out, this is a person of um, credibility and there's probably merit in what they're publishing. It was a bit of a cue. And with the changes that are happening, I'm not sure that's going to be the, the case. But I welcome the call out for government entities. Going back to the um, Trump campaigns, Big question marks around um, both Trump and Johnson in the UK on how social allegedly influenced voting. And if that's being cleaned up, that can only be good news uh, for, for users going forward. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I think I think w there is that brand, <coughs> excuse me, brand safety issue, um, which is, you know, the, the risk now of being trolled by people who look like they have authority yeah. um, but I think users are very smart and I, I, I quite like Susanna's point which says you know I'd say avoid brands who dodge their social responsibilities but we know of course many businesses are not that interested in doing well, that. Look at what I mean we're talking a lot about Twitter right I mean Cambridge Analytica Facebook I mean, you and I spent days bouncing around BBC News studios, helping audiences understand what that meant for their data with that particular hack. And in the weeks following, there was a vernacular that came out. I, I am leaving I, Facebook. I am not comfortable with how my data is being managed at Facebook. This could be the doom and gloom for Facebook. Weeks later, they hit a record uh, number on their earnings call. And then they backed it up the following quarter with incremental numbers too. So... I think opinion can be swayed. I, where I think Twitter is different is it's been the gross impact on many thousands of people on the eve of Thanksgiving. We should have been giving thanks and gratitude to staff in the 10 days running up to um, yesterday's momentous event in, in the US. But must just dispelled with that. And I mean, there's even a story, and, and I, I, I've been chasing this down last night and this morning. There is a Twitter developer, um, Yu Wei Zhang. He was part of um, the learning infra, uh, the machine learning um, infra team within Twitter. He claims that um, two weeks ago he was offered three months severance. And, and invited to leave, reluctantly took it. He was then invited, um, told, we've made a mistake, we want to get you back. So he came back. And then on the eve of Thanksgiving, hours before Thanksgiving, was fired and now he's only been given one month severance. And I'm led to believe he's one of about 50 people that happened to yesterday evening. Those stories just don't sit favourably with people. No. And when we're trying... Well, look, we know Twitter has been a toxic platform. I think it would be naive of anyone to say otherwise. 
but it, it feels like there's been a big hit on the reset button. And I think there is a fear that it, it's going to recede by about five or six years in the short term. We've seen hate speech increased in the last two weeks. Musk, 24 hours ago, claimed that hate speech impressions are one third lower from pre-spike levels. And in the follow-up thread, he was asked what that's based on. And he claims it's the same criteria Twitter were using before ownership. So he's comparing data like for like. Now, if the graph he's published is accurate, then that's an encouraging sign. A drop of a third would be very, very good. And he, he suggests on his line graph that its base rate is now better than what it was two months ago within Twitter. The, the counter argument to that is, I mean, the poor lady that, that, who identifies as a woman now, the, the, the member of the trans community I told you has been fired. Oh, my gosh. The visceral that is on the poor woman's feed for doing a media story is horrendous. You look at what's going on with the World Cup at the moment, and there are valid questions being asked of that. Again, it is quite punchy and spiky. I'm personally seeing more of that hate speech on Twitter than other platforms, but that's just a single data point. Personally, I'm yet to be convinced that hate speech is getting under control in the way that Musk suggests. But if he can do that, then that's good for the platform and that's good for users. But questions still to be answered. So I think it's quite interesting how Philip has, has um, mentioned the fact that, you know, being aligned with... Twitter at the moment, mate, the reputation, reputational damage might be quite high. And another, again, American study, and I'll put these in the comments afterwards, but um, suggests that like 54% of Americans would not buy from a brand that associated with this kind of negative reputation. So I think, I think that's quite interesting. But we yeah. want to talk about what brands should do. And I yeah. really like Asha's comment, Good which question. is... For, for brands which use Twitter to keep a close relationship, and let's face it, a lot of them, not only do you have the kind of innocent drinks that have built this wonderful rapport on social media, but you also have a large majority of brands who are using um, Twitter to, to do uh, customer relations, um, uh, 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 sort of customer service type stuff. So to suddenly minimize posting to to disappear from the platform how should how should brands handle this yeah it's a really good question and the, the advice that we gave our clients over the last 10 days was for the time being dial back on your your, your twitter ad spend um we were less nervous about organic content going out and indeed on the if feed you will see on our channels including twitter we've had organic content continue to, to, to drip out, but we've not been spending on, on the, the, the paid. I've been telling clients to take a breath. There's a lot of questions coming up that do not need to be answered today. There were a lot of brands, CBS, a case in point, that rushed out and said, Twitter's dying, or what, I'm not quoting now, I'm very much paraphrasing, so don't go looking for this like for like tweet, but Twitter's over, we're going to move away, we're not comfortable with this. Um, and they were very bullshy with their, uh, their language about we're dropping Twitter. 48 hours later, there was um, a single tweet posted by, not on the CBS main channel, but on the CBS uh, PR channel that said, having reviewed content, we will be continuing to gauge and continue to monitor. And that monitoring bit is what brands should be doing at the moment, because there are far too many questions open right now for brands to make conclusive decisions. So if you're a consumer brand and you have time sensitive campaigns right now, our advice to you is move the ad spend across any of the other um, channels. And if you don't have ad accounts set up, well, that's a challenge for you. Um, connect with us afterwards and we'll figure out how we can sort of help you, you, you with that. But Twitter is not the lone wolf solution to your commercial goals this season. There are other platforms you can be on. For brands that don't have time sensitive um, uh, uh, campaigns right now, you need to be taking a pause and making sure that you get all the right information to determine for your brand whether the risk of association to Twitter is acceptable. And I don't think we've got all the information today. I mean, looking ahead to 
uh, next week. I think next week is going to be quite key in some of the answers coming out. I mean, Musk has said that, um, for example, speed of internet uh, of Twitter use outside of the US has taken a massive jump. We won't know until next week whether that the data substantiates that. The verification and copyright and protection model coming out. Questions have been asked, not answered, about what's happening with content moderation. And we need answers to those questions to be able to then look brands in the eye and say, okay, this is where your risk is. These are the decisions you need to make. And I think part of the concern around the continued departures out of Twitter, everyone knows how tough it is to recruit right right, right now. Whilst there are good people on the market, being able to move quickly isn't always challenging. And to get um, highly skilled workers in, you're, you're lucky if you're landing on those quickly. So the question remains is how quickly can these talented coders be replaced? And does that present risk to brands and having things like their um, paid media accounts associated with Twitter right now? We have told all customers who don't have insertion orders via an agency to remove all their billing details because of the two-factor authentication and risk. You've probably seen in the news as well, um, people, there was a data breach last week. And I mean, yesterday, there was engine, four engineers going on the record about it who have been banned from Twitter today. And there's been no justification given as to why they've been banned. Now, this is the same platform that's welcoming um, Trump back, who allegedly, and I, I, I use that word because of the ongoing process, he allegedly incited violence, which led to people being harmed around the capital riots, right? So I've, I've got to be careful to say on this topic because there's a legal ongoing um, uh, situation stateside. But for a platform to welcome back those individuals and then ban people who are openly using freedom of speech to supposedly report fact to what's going on on Twitter, that doesn't really align to Musk's assertion of freedom of speech and that it's going to be a self-moderating entity. And for that reason, I think we need more time to see whether this really is going to be a censored view of what Musk wants or whether it's going to be an inclusive platform for all. I'm quite sceptical around this and I think we need time to answer it. It's funny, isn't it? We do love a drama, social media people. Um, (laughs) We can't help ourselves. But it could be that this is a storm in a teacup and it quietens down once the egos are moved out of this. I absolutely love Michael's conversation, uh, Michael's comment, which I've just popped yeah. up. There. And the, the main reason is that we are being asked this a lot. Um, so further to to, to, to to Tasha's comment, do the pros of customer relationships, brand reach outweigh the cons of Twitter's setup and conduct? And I think this is a really good question because this is the, the nub of why why we can we can offer advice to, as to what to do now, which is maybe slow things down, take your advertising yeah. off, don't comment, but don't leave yet in case there's... No, don't release your handles. Keep them those negative comments that you need to address yeah. um, is that the individuality of the business decision around this will depend on where you stand on particular issues. Yeah. Um, but let me give you some fact based on advertising, because I, I like Michael's question and where he's going with this. And uh, look, LinkedIn is the most costly platform to spend advertisement on. You are paying for a quality of conversion and a surety around hitting a, a business audience. And that's why the, the cost per clicks, um, your uh, cost per million, your th- thousand impressions is normally higher. Twitter has been an excellent platform for getting affordable and quality reach and frequency. Uh, Reach being the number of people that you reach with your own advertising campaign and frequency being the number of appearances the ad set lands with that that audience. And the costs are far more favorable on on Twitter. I'm talking pence versus pounds, cents versus dollars, right? It is, it is, there's no, it's not even close. Um, there's quite a cavern. But Twitter is not the only platform that does that. And the question I get asked more than anything when I, I say this point, I push people to Facebook because Facebook has, or Meta Group, I should say, has compar- a comparable reach and frequency. The immediate reaction is, well, that's not a business community. No. 
but some of our best use cases as a business, particularly around video engagement and creating touch points and then click throughs to site. Significant um, over indexing of performance has come on Facebook. You've got to get your content right, but if you wanted to get affordable reach and frequency right now, then Meta is definitely an offering for you. TikTok is another platform for the consumer markets, which if you're not already on it, you should be exploring. It is a little more expensive, but again, based on the demographics you're trying to reach, you might be able to justify those costs based on the returns you get for, for the audience. Cool. The other thing I've seen is an increase this past year on consumer products within LinkedIn. And we know this is, as LinkedIn partners, this is something LinkedIn have been pushing for quite a, a, a while. And there are changes going on in the background. Both of those social platforms have been buying up businesses and making changes within their algorithms in the back end that makes them more um, conducive to the markets they're not associated with. So um, Facebook now um, uh, is compatible with Salesforce and you can collect leads straight out of Meta and, and bring them into your, your Salesforce. That's as a result of a business that Meta bought two years ago. They've got a data sciences um, business within the group that allows them to mine and surface data to improve your, your targeting. So the B2B ad platform has come on leaps and bounds compared to five, six, seven years ago. Four years ago, we got um, Fujitsu Forum TV started, and that really is our standout B2B um, uh, use case. In the consumer markets, when we were doing things like X Factor with lastminute.com, Facebook was a cornerstone of that spend because of the returns and engagement you got. Now, Twitter had a really good, has a really good ad platform. I'm get my tenses right. But if you've got concerns about the brand right now, there are other alternatives for you so that your KPIs, your metrics, your MQLs, your SQLs, your um, time-sensitive um, spend campaigns can move. Buy yourself some time to have the right discussions internally. Don't do a CVS and rush a decision and regret it because a week ago i genuinely thought twitter may go pop because of the resources going out the door now i'm minded to say i can't see that happening but i can see certain products and services being affected in the short term and we need to figure out whether those affected products are the products that bring risk to your brand and we're not quite yet not quite there yet with the answers Exactly. So we've pulled together a risk assessment, <clears throat> Excel spreadsheet thing, the way you can work out, you could, it, it logically takes you through some of these steps from reputational risk, moral risk, financial risk, legal risk, data privacy risks. So that you can work out as a business what your next action should be. I want to bring up, Neville, Neville has popped in a, a really interesting um comment here which is i think that when many big advertisers desert twitter that's when we'll get that tipping point and it's already we've got we know general mills volkswagen uh pfizer Mon mondeley yeah. uh, alliance um carlsberg and north face yeah. are leaving but i have a question for those that may be there, there might be a case for a brand that is not impacted in their market by this. It might be specific marketplace or category that actually doing more on Twitter might work. I'm, I'm just going to throw this very negative question out there. And the reason is, of course, prices are going to drop because yeah. now the big advertisers are leaving. Does that mean that Twitter is more viable for businesses who maybe couldn't have spent that amount of money? That's a really awkward question. To no, 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 there, are, there are two or three parts to this, and I, I, hold me to account if I don't answer all of them. Do I think all of those advertisers are withdrawing from Twitter? No, I don't. I think they are paused. And in fact, Volkswagen published content after they claimed to have withdrawn. It was a use case I was looking at quite, quite closely. Um, <clears throat> One of those brands you mentioned, and I won't call them out, but one of those brands was equally visceral around Facebook Cambridge Analytica. A 10 million pound ad withdrawal, they said. We will not be aligning to Facebook Group, they said. Guess where they were spending money a few weeks later. So I'm, I'm yet to be convinced that this is 
a permanent signal. Some of those businesses are listed on stock market, so they have to be seen to be doing the right thing by audiences because ultimately um, uh, those sentiments and impacts could have commercial um, challenges for them, and I understand that. But I don't think we'll know for a month or so whether brands really have withdrawn um, or whether this is just a, a threat. Neville makes a really good point because the lifeblood of social revenue is paid media income. I know Musk talks about this future <laughs> app with uh, Twitter being the cornerstone of its other potential. And if you look to things that he's done with PayPal and Tesla, I think he's looking to bolt on many, many other services that perhaps he can monetize off the back of the Twitter app as a means to reach users. So he's bought the platform, I believe, for its user base, its connectivity, and then wants to monetize additional services on it. But that's going to take time. Um, so I don't think those brands are totally off. But you do make a valid point around the bid rates. And if you're a brand right now who is not concerned by what's going on and you're not as concerned by the impact to um, the alleged 5,600 that have been jettisoned from, from Twitter, then yes, the bid rates around campaigns will be much lower at this time of year. Now, anyone that serves advertising from the, the famed P9, this is the period nine um, marker within the, the calendar, so the back to school window just before September, that's really what you've heard me say this many times over the years. It's not just back to school, Christmas driver starts, right? Adverts start seeding from P9 and they go incrementally up until about week one of December, right? If all of those brands have taken that spend out, think about Carlsberg and wanting to shift product in the run up to Christmas, there's category opportunity. But it comes back to that question. How comfortable are you being associated with what's going on at Twitter at the moment? And getting an extra bang for your buck, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And I guess depending on your role, your position, um, how customer facing you are, you've probably got differing views on that. But it's not a simple scenario to to answer. And it's not one broad brush applied to, to, to everyone because there's a cost of living crisis going on as well at the moment. Businesses are struggling with rising central costs. SMEs have not had the support that they probably should have from government. We know that we're in the same boat ourselves. So if you've got a couple of months where you might be able to get beneficial uh, marketing qualified leads through smart social, you probably need to be having a conversation on it. But you've also got to have broad shoulders to carry some of the backlash that you might get from your own staff if you continue to push ahead with Twitter. They will have questions. If you can justify that, then it might be right for your band. But it comes down to can the brand justify it against their beliefs, their value systems, their leadership, their conduct, what they do from a CSR perspective. One of the things Musk is going to struggle with is the recovery from trust erosion. And I, and I really believe that. I, I, I think he's got quite a journey with certain audiences to, to, to fix it. If you go in on Twitter, are you going to erode trust with your staff, your customer base? Again, if you can justify it, you should probably have a conversation around it. But only brands can make these decisions, right? This is very much an internal thing. Lovely comment here by Georgie. Hi, Georgie. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, we should catch up soon. Uh, I, I think it's going to be important for individuals and businesses to dis ascertain, big long word there for a Friday, whether their brand values align with platform actions. But it's also important that we separate individual out outrage. And I think this is actually quite key because this yeah. is what I kind of was alluding to over the drama that we love. Um for, and morals from best practice for business. Actually, this is a, a really smart response, which is that separation of the emotional against um, against what the business requires now and how the business is positioned. Yeah. That's why doing a very, you know, Excel spreadsheet style risk assessment takes some of the emotion out of this, the knee-jerk reaction, yeah. and allows us to think how we might do it. And I, I think... One of the one of the elements that adds to what you've just said, CJ, is the fact that Musk is also pushing the idea that the World Cup will raise the stakes on, on Twitter. Now, we know 
football is massive. If a, if a match is playing, the only thing trending in what's trending is football. Yeah. Uh, so we know that the conversations are going to going to fly high and for many brands yeah. that does present an opportunity to reach an audience which they normally couldn't get to yeah I, and you know I, georgie makes a really good point and it, it there, there definitely has been virtue signaling with the super brands let's not suggest otherwise and that, i think some of that are those pr statements that we we've seen coming out i think are explained why they've possibly done that to protect share price and stakeholder in investment and not having to answer tough calls on earnings, uh, tough questions on earning calls. Um, the individual rage versus um, what's right for the business and not being morally caught up. And Georgie's last part of her um, statement, no platform is morally right. It's a really good point because, I mean, look, Zuckerberg has been robotic-like at some times when he's been speaking to people. Uh, Facebook, Meta have made endless errors, but whether it was Zuckerberg himself or whether this came from um, his director of uh, policy, the, the, the former deputy prime minister, Nick Clegg, forcing him to come out and apologise, Zuck has occasionally come out and said, OK, we got it wrong and this is now what we're going to be doing. I think Musk coming out and acknowledging what, they got right or wrong would go some way to doing it but of course i don't think we're going to see that anytime soon because an admission of getting it wrong now probably means he's culpable for the lawsuits he's he's facing but it's decisions that need to be made right and this is going to be really personal for those businesses and right now they've got to be asking themselves what's more important reach reputation um are we concerned by what's happened to to the staff can we justify why we continue to operate within a channel that's across the news headlines some of those headlines are well out of control and there is inaccurate reporting. Let me just make that clear. For all of the negative that I've charted with Twitter, there has been an awful lot of conjecture which has not um, happened. But 5,600 people have left. 2,500 of those have been fired. Um, there is a visa issue within Twitter right now, which I know some people find very distasteful. There are a number of migrant workers on what's called a HB1 visa. This is a, a foreign worker visa. It's assigned to the business. And if an employee was to leave voluntarily, um, they lose that visa. Now, if dismissed um, or put on severance, they have 60 days in which they have to secure employment or the visa is revoked. And there are a lot of stories right now about uh, that would mean individuals and their families being deported from the United States. So again, when you see developers leaving and then Musk posting a few hours later that we're now hiring coders and developers, from an employment law perspective, there are some tough questions there. I suspect HR professionals, and please don't take this the wrong way. I love HR professionals. <laughs> I, I comply with all of your rules. So please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. I suspect HR professionals will have more issues with Twitter right now than, say, um, some of the more entrepreneurial um, orientated people within businesses. And that's why organizations need to bring multiple people together to have an open conversation about the rights and wrongs of Twitter the values of being associated with Twitter and whether we can justify it as a business. And if you can justify it, <laughs> then there is good opportunity to, to be had. But you've got to be comfortable with that. And to um, uh, to the point that, that we, was raised by Georgie, there probably needs to be a parking of personal uh, reaction with corporate. And I probably need to park my first love of Twitter with, with some of this. It's a, it's a good point, well made. True, isn't it? I think Tom Tom presents a lovely balanced view, which is why, why I've put this up, because while history tells us that brands and people may not forgive and forget, they can become desensitised to the problems and eventually revert back to what works for the business or on a personal level. And I think you see it on TikTok. There is lots of question marks over where our data is going on TikTok and you know, who owns TikTok, but yeah. yet people are still going there. So I, I I think we have to be a bit more balanced. Yeah. That also don't, don't be outraged for outrage's sake. Yeah, exactly. Ask the right <laughs> questions for your business and and align all of the valid questions for your business. And if you can comfortably answer those, then that is probably saying crack on. Yeah. But if you're an organization 
who has recently um, delivered a public CSR campaign talking about how you're a people first organization and equality is a cornerstone of, of your, your company and that um, your, this is what we're doing to advance equality, inclusivity, um, et cetera. Twitter's a tough brand to be aligned to at the moment because if you look at some of the photos of the coding team and you will see it on Musk's own feed, this, there's a photo of um, the developers that were with him at 1.15 in the morning. He was having a huddle in the San Fran offices. Spot the woman within that picture, yeah. right? Just a month earlier, if you scroll through Twitter's own media on their account, my gosh, they were a wonderfully inclusive and equal employer. And right now there are questions around that. So again, we've all got individual views, as Georgie rightly says, but as a business, only you are going to be able to yeah. say whether these challenges and happenings are awkward for your business right now. I think we can comfortably say that the, the platform will be around. Twitter will be there long term. So it's now, do they play a role within your marketing model and, and do they align to your values? And that's really where the conversation has now gone. So the last, the last question I want to cover is, <clears throat> if not Twitter, where? I mean, I did a little poll, which got which I should just shoving up in front of our faces at the moment, which got a fair number of votes, not as many as I'd like. And of course, it was done on LinkedIn, which means LinkedIn it'll ha it'll have a bias towards yeah. some, some of the channels. Um, but I thought it was just super interesting because <clears throat> for a large part of it, until LinkedIn kind of took over, uh, what what we saw was actually pretty much even Stevens, which is that that nobody had a real massive preference for for switching between Twitter and another channel. Um, but, and I, and I think that's really, you know, we're at that crossroads again where we've seen the rise of Mastodon, which has now got 2 million followers, yet there's no opportunity at the moment for advertisers. And it's a decentralised, uh, disintermediated, I could never say that word, but you know what I mean, it's Friday. Um, Disintermediated, yeah, you know, know yes, yes, you're right, it is. <laughs> um, it, it's that kind of platform, and there's a lot of interest in this kind of element. There's also Reddit, TikTok, um, Tumblr. Some people have talked about Tumblr, which is still a massive network. Yeah, if you want to giggle, <laughs> Tumblr still has a role to play in your, yeah, exactly. your day to day so, I mean, what are what are should brands be looking at alternatives? Should they, you know, if they're pausing their advertising, should they be putting it somewhere else? Well, they, they should be doing this anyway, irrespective of what's going on with Twitter. I mean, I, 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 I've just I've written another blog for us, which comes out. Uh, it's been published on the 6th um, of December because it's aligned to the event that we've just done. And the sentiment of the piece is, we need to have more heads up marketing. And I, I've taken that phrase from sport. We talk in sport about I'm playing the game with heads up so we can see what's happening around us and we can ascertain where the opportunities are in front of us. And heads up football, heads up rugby, the most talented of people are able to read the game and, and capitalise on opportunities. And unfortunately, within marketing, I do think we get stuck in the ruts of doing what we've done. Henry Ford's great quote, which I will not, get right off the top of my head but it, it was largely if you continue to do what you you've done you will get what you've got or words to that effect <laughs> he was talking to an engineer on the production line that's such a quote for friday <laughs> <laughs> I, I can imagine people just rolling their eyes going oh come on cj you can do better than that it's been a long week um, but the point was we have to keep evaluating change and one of the things that does not happen enough within social media marketing is the evaluation of properties and audience Part of that, I don't want this to be a bashing of a, a brands, but you've got limited marketing spend. We've got limited content creation resources. If we're struggling to make that sort of apply to what we've currently got within our estate, how can we possibly add another one? But equally, if we're not regularly taking a step back and asking ourselves, where are the people we wish to reach? And by the way, not using your guts for this, following the data, using analysis tools to determine what channels they're on, where their dwell time is. If you're not getting that information, you probably can't categorically say we have the right social 
um, channel mix within our marketing. If you're one of the brilliant marketers doing that, bravo, well done you, I absolutely applaud you. But brands should be looking at this anyway because B2B is slow to be looking at TikTok. And there's only so many years that you can get away with saying, oh, well, it's not, it's not right for us now. I remember having this same conversation around LinkedIn and Facebook circa 2008, 2009, when there were lots of people thinking, no, social's not for us, that's for the kids. Well, I mean, look what's happened since then, right? Yeah. A, a lot of people have now realized that they, they got that wrong. Don't be caught out again. Apps will evolve. The internet will evolve. Code will evolve. Opportunities will evolve. Who could have thought we'd have driverless cars like a decade ago? Right. It, the, the rapid rate of change over the ensuing decade will be like nothing we have seen before. So if we're not taking a breath to actually ask ourselves, where are the stakeholders we are going to want to reach and influence? You cannot possibly know you've got the right channel mix. Yeah. Take this as an opportunity to do that wonderful piece of work and then start looking at your um, your content strategy and your content tilt for next year. And if you don't know what content tilts are, I'd love to catch up with you after this because there's there's opportunity for marketers here next year yeah. who are determined to put out good, impactful, influential content. There's not enough of that happening at the moment. So true. Um, so in summary, I think there's some, some interesting parts in this. I think the first thing is I loved Georgie's point, and that's the point of uh, the... Uh, risk assessment so slide into my dm send me your email i will send it out to you you don't have to fill in great big forms this is not some weird demand gen thing I never thought I'd even say on an open call slide into my dms but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> i love that idea of <laughs> um but i think no knee jerk reactions are required just yet have thoughtful think your way through this monitor what's going using monitoring listening tools not just what what turns up in your feed um i think that f the advice we are currently giving clients is reduce and only do essential organic keep your profile so you can respond if fake accounts appear or something weird happens stop advertising for the moment pause it for the moment and elena asked one i'm just going to sneak this one in but elena asked really Really good question. I'm just going to dig it out so I can put it up. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, right. Which is how long should you pause for? <laughs> good question. You know what? I'm, I'm tempted to turn that um, back on. For, for those of you who are not familiar, Elena is one of our brilliant staff and she actually runs a lot of the paid. So I'm going to turn that round on you, Elena. I mean, how long yeah. do you think the pause uh, should be? Look, I. I don't think we need to put a time bound on this. I, as long as you can get, as long as you can achieve your KPI goals, whatever they are, whether they're monetary orientated through um, seasonal um, gift purchases or whether it's your a B2B who's looking at your run to the, the, the end of the fiscal year, 31st of March, whatever your goals and purpose is, is publishing Twitter content this week and next week going to be critical to the outcome? And if the answer to that is no, don't put yourself under pressure to, to force a, a solution on this, right? And play on the other channels for the interim would be um, would be my recommendation. But I can be a hot-headed individual and I can knee-jerk my way through a lot, but I'm also very, very good at crisis communications and I've done a lot of crisis over the years with some of the biggest brands because... I know when it's right to take a step back and take a pause and see what unfolds. Yeah. And that's definitely where we're at at the moment. Totally agree. Totally agree. So thank you very much. Please continue the discussion. If you've got more questions, pop them in there. If you're watching this on delay, so for my American colleagues and friends, uh, please keep responding in here. We will monitor this over the next sort of couple of couple of days, if not a couple of weeks. So keep asking as things develop what you want to do. Request the risk assessment if you want it. Just even just have a look at it, even if you don't want to fill it in. And, and, and you know, feel free to chat to me or CJ or any of the team um, if you have any kind of challenges that you need to address on a more personal to your business view. Thank you very much. 
I'll, we'll see you hopefully soon. Enjoy your weekends. Have fun. Thank you.